Um, on March 28th, we'll have Glenn Branch with a child's garden of climate change denial. On April 11th, we will have uh, PRI's director, Warren Allman, talking about his recent trip to Antarctica. Uh, our Earth Day program on April 25th will likely be on plastics in the environment following the National Earth Day theme, but we haven't quite nailed down all of the details yet. And then we'll close out the season on May 9th with the uh, teachers who have sailed on the Joides Resolution, the uh, flagship of ocean research. And are we live again, Rob, for now? I believe we are live. And as far as I know, um, the problem was that I had <laughs> the YouTube video open. So Okay, so, um, so we've done the introductions of what's coming up. I am going to hand it off to Rob, who's going to say a few words about um, uh, Darwin Days, and then he's going to introduce Andy. So take it away, Rob. All right, very good. Thank you all for joining us this evening. This is the 18th annual Darwin Days series of events that has been put on by the Paleontological Research Institution. They have historically been primarily in Ithaca, but with Science in the Virtual Pub, we've been able to go national, obviously. And, um, but we will, for those who are in the Ithaca area, have a family activity day on Saturday morning with a variety of activities related to uh, life in the Devonian period. And so that will take place from 10 to one uh, on Saturday morning. Every year we choose a theme associated with Darwin Days. And this year the theme is the evolution of, of um, life in the oceans and in particular invertebrates that might seem like a very narrow topic <laughs> but in fact there uh, has is an extensive literature with some important uh research on um using devonian invertebrate fossils to study evolution you might have heard of concepts like punctuated equilibrium and coordinated stasis so um it, it does play an important uh, the devonian plays an important uh role in uh, what we know about how evolution occurs in the geologic past, but it, it also happens to be the bedrock <laughs> around Ithaca, New York. And as Don said, our current temporary exhibit features the Devonian bedrock of New York State and its extensive fossil record. Uh, and that there's also a significant fraction of the Museum of the Earth Journey Through Time exhibits devoted to the Devonian. So it makes a lot of sense for us to concentrate on this particular topic um, now you might wonder if Darwin Days is focused on evolution, what we're doing with the talk about extinction. <laughs> but of course, if you take a moment to reflect, what has gone extinct has played a really major role in what sorts of things then later evolve. Uh, so it has long been an important part of uh, the study of, of uh, evolutionary paleobiology. And so we are honored uh, this evening to have with us Andy Bush, uh, who is um, a professor in the Department of uh, Earth Sciences at the University of Connecticut. Uh, Andy has been a big thinker in paleobiology for a couple of decades, working on all kinds of topics from um, uh, uh, biodiversity and extinction and thinking about biases in the fossil record. Uh, although he'll be talking about the Devonian this evening, he has looked at everything from Cambrian early animals to dinosaurs. So he's, his research is really quite broad and fascinating. Um, Andy got his bachelor's and his master's degrees at uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech, which has long been um, one of the power centers of paleobiology and then went on to get his PhD uh, at Harvard. And, um, and he's been he has a wide variety of collaborators, including uh, folks at PRI and um, at least one person uh, on this call, which is Jay Lee Peer, uh, at, uh, who has been a graduate student at Cornell University. So um, Andy, thank you for being here this evening and we'll pass it off to you. Thanks, uh, thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate the, uh, uh, the invitation to to participate in the the Darwin Days, 
And I also have to say, for those of you in, in Ithaca or, or Western New York, I'm, I'm very jealous of your bedrock. Uh, I've been living, you know, the past several decades on on metamorphic rocks, and it, it's terrible. Um, I, I would, I, my life would be so much better if I, if I had nice Devonian bedrock uh, under my feet all the time. Um, so let's see, let me uh, get my slides going here. You know what? I need to share the screen before I start projecting. Okay. And before I do anything else, let me activate the laser pointer. Okay. So I got into paleontology and, and studying studying fossils mostly just because I you know I enjoy it I, I love collecting fossils I I love uh, learning about fossils but uh to start off this talk I wanted to to kind of step back and say a couple of words about you know why you know why we study e extinction in the fossil record and 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 why fossils are are really important to to how we understand the world around us um and I know I've promised a talk here about uh, New York and its paleontology, but I'm going to start off with a little digression uh, down in Virginia. Uh, and as you just heard, you know, I lived for a number of years in Virginia, but I never actually uh, visited Monticello, uh, Thomas Jefferson's estate, until this past summer. And, uh, uh, you know, this is, you know, Jefferson's famous estate. It's on the back of the, the U.S. nickel. Um, and if you Go on the tour, which I highly recommend. You know, you you approach the building from this direction and enter through these these doors here, and you go into to Jefferson's front hall, which he had set up as a a, a little museum of sorts, um, full of maps and and other artifacts that he he wanted to show off to to any visitors he, he had, um, and a lot of it relates to you know the 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 early history of the United States and the the exploration of of North America which he was uh, very connected with. Um, but because of this, when you walk in through the, the front doors of Monticello, the first thing you see, or the first thing I saw when I walked into Monticello was fossils. Um, there's a mastodon jawbone sitting right there uh, in, in his foyer. And it's not the exact one that that he had on display when he was alive, because unfortunately that one got got destroyed, but it's it's very similar to, to one that that he would have had there. So, uh, you know, I got I got pretty interested in this. You know, why did Jefferson have these these fossils right there in his, his foyer to show off? And it turns out he was pretty obsessed with with mammoths and mastodons. Uh, hold on, my lights are on a timer and they turn off. Um, he was obsessed with mammoths and mastodons, uh, although at the time uh, they hadn't quite figured out the difference between the two. And part of the reason he was so interested in them was that you know he wanted to prove to some some snooty Europeans that that the uh, the new world had you know enormous exciting animals just just like the old world, um, but these these mammoths and mastodons were also at the center of a of a big scientific uh, uh, controversy at the time. Um, in the latest 1700s, Georges Cuvier, uh, a Frenchman and uh, one of the most prominent scientists at the time had uh, done a study of, of mammoth bones and compared them to modern elephant bones and showed that they were, in fact, different species. And he used this to argue, really, for the first time that extinction was, was a thing that happened. Um, the logic being that if, you know, uh, a mammoth was still alive, uh, somebody surely would have, would have found one by now. Uh, and at this, in this day and age, uh, most people didn't believe in extinction, um, uh, largely for religious reasons. Um, and, you know, when you found fossils of things that nobody had ever seen alive, the common uh, thing you said is, well, uh, it, it's probably alive somewhere. Uh, we just haven't found it yet. And that actually makes a lot of sense for some things, um, particularly things that live in the oceans, because at the time we had very little idea what what lived in the oceans. And, you um, uh, you know, there were a few things we found as fossils that we thought were extinct that that turned out to be alive in the deep ocean. 
Um, but Cuvier argued that you couldn't really apply that that logic to to mammoths. Um, and so, uh, for all of these reasons, Jefferson really re what he really wanted to do was was find a live mammoth or, or live mastodon. He loved getting the the fossils, and he had people send him fossils. And apparently, he tried to reassemble a skeleton while he was in the White House. Uh, but he really wanted to find a living one. And so when he sent Lewis and Clark out on their their famous expedition out west, he he told them to keep their eyes open. Uh, he was he was hoping they would they would uh, come back with reports of uh, of living mammoths and mastodons. Um, so the the point of this this is that you know without fossils, people would have been it would have taken us much much longer to accept the idea of extinction. Um, it took the fossils to prove it. And even with fossils, you know, people were really, really reluctant to accept the idea of extinction at first. Um, and I'm willing to bet that if we didn't have any fossils, you know, we would have accepted by now the idea that things can go extinct because we've, we've seen species go extinct. But I bet that probably most people would think that extinction was the exception rather than the rule. Whereas the fossil record shows us that, you know, extinction is just the normal fate of, of any species. So jumping forward in time a little bit to Darwin. Um, I have to throw in a, a Darwin slide in this talk. Uh, by the time Darwin was writing The Origin of Species, uh, the fossil record was uh, known much better. And people had made the observation that there were certain points in the fossil record where it seemed like a bunch of species all disappeared all at the same time. Uh, so like the, the loss of the dinosaurs and the, the ammonites at the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, and Darwin famously uh, didn't accept that this as you know, evidence of, of what we would call a mass extinction. He uh, uh, didn't think that that's what was going on. He thought that you know, maybe there was just some problem with the fossil record, some incompleteness issue. That, that made it look this way, but he didn't think it really was. Um, and it was only after a lot of work by a lot of paleontologists over many years that, that we finally convinced ourselves and other people that mass extinctions were actually things that really happened, that you could have these global catastrophes that would kill off an enormous proportion of the Earth's species over a relatively short period of time. And again, people didn't really want to believe this. It was just the weight of the fossil evidence that that showed it. And sometimes I like to think, you know, what would this world be like if we didn't have fossils? You know, we're we're you know moving towards a time of of you know climate change, um, potentially you know another mass extinction in the in the coming centuries, and you know if we didn't have the fossil record to prove that mass extinctions can happen. Would we even realize what was coming at us? Would we be able to plan? Um, so I think fossils are, are really important to how we view the world. And, you know, we'd be in a much worse place uh, uh, in the next several centuries if we didn't have these, these lessons from the fossil record. So that's kind of what's motivating, you know, my research is this, this idea of, you know, as we approach this this. Uh, uh, sixth mass extinction, as it's been called in, in the coming centuries, you know, what else can fossils teach us about extinction? Um, and I'm not the only one who's, who's certainly who's trying to do this. You know, quite a number of paleontologists are going out and looking at mass extinctions and, and other events and, and trying to pull some, some lessons out of them. And, you know, I, I haven't discovered anything as, as earth shattering as, as, as Darwin did, of course, but hopefully I'll, I'll show you some interesting tidbits uh, uh, from the record of the late Devonian extinction in, in New York. So just a little review before we get going. Here's a, a timeline of the history of animal life on Earth, uh, starting with the uh, uh, earliest evidence of animals in the late Proterozoic. Lots more evidence in the Cambrian, um, with groups like arthropods and mollusks becoming common. Then in the middle of the Paleozoic, including the Devonian, uh, fish are diversifying and plants and arthropods are diversifying on land. A bit later in the Paleozoic, land vertebrates are diversifying. Then in the Triassic, we start to get dinosaurs and mammals, flowering plants in the Cretaceous. 
and then mammals and birds and flowering plants diversifying in the Cenozoic. And this history of diversification was interrupted by uh, a number of mass extinctions. And these are the ones that are usually called the big five mass extinctions of, of the fossil record. And here it's just listing the uh, uh, most commonly discussed uh, uh, kill mechanisms for each of these events. You can see it varies from global cooling to volcanism and global warming to uh, asteroid impact at the end of the Cretaceous. Um, I got interested in the, the late Devonian extinction in, partly, in part because it seemed kind of weird compared to the others. Um, you know, I'm a child of the 80s, so I grew up with the uh, uh, asteroid impact theory for the, the Cretaceous extinction. So that was always kind of my mental model for what a mass extinction was, like one big nasty event that, that killed a bunch of things all at once. Uh, and in contrast, uh, the late Devonian mass extinction is actually a, a series of what you might call medium-sized mass extinctions. Um, the ones I'm going to talk about today are a, a, a two-pulse extinction that's sometimes called the late Devonian extinction or Franian Femenian extinction. Uh, but there's a number of other extinction pulses in the, in the later Devonian as well. Um, and all that's happening within the context of, you know, land plants expanding on land, um, uh, land vertebrates taking their first steps out onto land, fish diversifying. So lots of lots of different things going on in the world. So what was the world like? Uh, I'm going to focus on on the oceans here because that's the, the fossil record I'm going to look at. Um, if you've collected Devonian fossils in 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 New York, you you know there's lots of invertebrates like brachiopods and crinoids and mollusks, bryzoans, trilobites, things like that. Uh, in some parts of the world, there were large reefs at this time built by an extinct group of sponges. And there were lots of fish around too, uh, in particular placoderms or armored fish. Um, uh, and modern groups of fish like sharks and ray fin fish were, were around, but not super diverse yet. And this fish in this diorama looks like it's a, uh, a lobe fin fish, um, so probably uh, a relative of, of the ancestors of, of land vertebrates. So the late Devonian mass extinction had two pulses and work by a number of people in different parts of the world suggest that those two pulses were probably about 800,000 years apart in time. So a little less than a mil million years apart. And uh, also in most parts of the world, the second pulse of the extinction is described as being the bigger one. So all those reef building sponges died out and it was, uh, many millions of years before before uh, large-scale reefs started forming again. Uh, and lots of brachiopod, lots of species of brachiopods, trilobites, crinoids, fish, etc., cetera, uh, also died out. And on land, the, the record of the extinction is a little a little tougher. There wasn't as, as much life on land at the time yet as, as there is now. And um, it's been a little, it's not as easy to, to work out the extinction. Excuse me. Uh, so why did things die? Well, the two uh, killers that are discussed uh, most often are global cooling. With uh, uh, There's geochemical evidence from, from a number of places around the world that uh, things cooled by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, coincident with both of these extinction pulses. And the other main theory is the spread of anoxic waters in the oceans. So spread of low oxygen conditions that, that smothered uh, things living there. Um, and there's lots of other ideas of, of how other global events might tie in, tie into these extinctions as well. Some people link it to the, the spread of land plants uh, in various ways. But these are the factors that, you know, are most commonly discussed as the, the immediate killers. So my goals with this, my goal, main goal with this project is simply to document the, the late Devonian extinction in New York and into northern Pennsylvania, uh, with some of the specific questions being, you know, which species went extinct and when, you know, how did the environment change at the time of the extinction, you know, what might have caused the extinction, and also how did 
communities and ecological interactions change as a result of the extinction? Um, so if you're looking, going out and collecting fossils to study a mass extinction, you have to uh, uh, find the uh, extinction layer um, where the extinction occurred. Um, but if you're looking at a, a series of rock layers, like in this cartoon, uh, the oldest layers are at the bottom, the youngest layers are at the top. So as you kind of go up through the series of layers, you can uh, look at how the uh, fauna changed through time if you collect the fossils. And in this cartoon, that's the extinction layer right there. This cartoon has dinosaurs, so this would be the, the famous iridium uh, layer at the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, so, you know, on the most basic level, what you're doing is collecting fossils from below the extinction layer, which means from before the extinction, uh, and comparing them with, with fossils you collect above the extinction layer, which means after the extinction. And that's basically what, what we've been doing, trying to find as, as many localities as we can. And this is one of them. Uh, this is in northern Pennsylvania. Uh, this is the uh, extinction layer for the first pulse of the extinction. And it's this, this dark shaley layer here. So just collecting, you know, tons of fossils from both below and above and comparing to see, you know, which species disappear and, and so on. And this is an outcrop showing the second extinction layer um, uh, at a location in New York. And if you want the names of the, the rock units we're looking at here, uh, the, the rocks immediately below the first pulse uh, are in the Wiskoi formation. The first extinction pulse uh, corresponds with the Pipe Creek formation, a dark shale layer. Above that is the Canisarega formation. And the, the second extinction pulse is, is near the top of that. These two extinction pulses are, are sometimes called the lower Kelvasser event and the upper Kelvasser event uh, after uh, 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 beds in Germany. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail on the on the stratigraphy here, but uh, if you if you're interested in it, we uh, recently had a paper come out in the uh, Big Devonian uh, volume published by PRI. So there's lots of different kinds of fossils in these rocks, um, but so far we've mostly concentrated on looking at brachiopods. And brachiopods have a shell made of calcite, which produces really good fossils. They were also very diverse and abundant in the Paleozoic. Uh, so there's just a ton of fossils of them out there. So they're very easy to, to, to work with. And they're still alive today, but there's only a few hundred species left. And they tend to live in, you know, like the deep ocean places like that. So they're they're not very well known in the, the modern world. So if you collect fossils, Devonian fossils in, in New York, you probably know a lot more about brachiopods than, than most biologists do. Uh, and they live in the oceans. They're suspension feeders. They catch little bits of food on their, their lophophore, on their, their feeding organ here. And... Uh, they have a, a shell made of two valves that open and close, kind of like an oyster, um, but they're not not particularly closely related to to, to oysters. Um, a lot of them have a, a, a stalk or other way of attaching down to the substrate, although back in, in the Paleozoic, some of them would just lie loose on the, the seafloor, and then some of them had spines to kind of root them in place. So here's some pictures of, of brachiopods from our rocks, and they are uh, labeled with the name of the order that they come from. And um, a lot of the fossils in the rocks that we, we've been collecting are, are just impressions or molds, like this one right here is just a mold, and, and this one, and, and this one. Um, and sometimes there's shell, but you can't really get it out of the rock. And as a result, we've had to haul a, a ton of rock back to, back to Connecticut because um, you usually can't separate the fossils from the rock. Um, in one or two places we've collected from, you can. This is a, a, a brachiopod that popped, popped out nicely. So here's North America in the late Devonian. Uh, here's the East Coast here. Uh, we're a little bit south of the equator, perhaps in sort of a, a subtropical uh, kind of climate. Zooming in. Here's Western New York, and here's Pennsylvania. 
And uh, there was a big mountain range over what's now the, the eastern seaboard. And where the Appalachian Mountains are now, there was a uh, seaway. And luckily, the outcrop belt in New York runs more or less east-west, pretty close to east-west, and crosses uh, this seaway such that you can sample lots of different uh, environments. If you go into west, far western New York, you're in deeper water. The, the rocks there are, are super shaly. Uh, a bit more to the east, you're, you were in more shallow marine conditions, uh, more sandstones and siltstones. These are the rocks that have lots of brachiopods. And then if you go even further east, you get into terrestrial deposits. And that's useful because, you know, we can collect in, in different habitats and, and try and sample, you know, as much of the as much of the, the brachiopod fauna as we can. So here's a geologic map. Uh, the black line here is the, the New York Pennsylvania border. Uh, and all of the yellow here is Devonian. And uh, the outcrop belt that exposes the extinction layers is shown by this red line. And again, if you're in Western New York, it's kind of deeper marine conditions, uh, more shallow marine through here, and then eventually up onto land. And you'll notice that the line showing the outcrop belt doesn't kind of continue all the way over here. That's just because we haven't uh, been able to trace it any further. Um, once you get up into these deposits, it's kind of hard to tell uh, where you are in, in time. So this shallow marine zone here circled in yellow is sort of our, our Goldilocks zone for finding brachiopods. And these are some of our, our more important uh, sites that we've collected uh, tons of samples from. Uh, but we have lots of other collecting sites uh, throughout this area. Here's a couple of photos of a couple of the sites in New York. Uh, a lot of the New York sites are stream cuts like these. Um, because those are, if you want to see a bunch of layers, you know, all in one place, that's that's the best place to go, where these these streams have, have cut down to bedrock. Uh, once you get into Pennsylvania, uh, we've looked at more at road cuts, and the, the rocks, once you cross the border, are uh, often a little bit tilted. And so you can walk along a, a road cut like this and kind of sample the different layers as, as you go. And... Uh, uh, to to do this project, we've basically just been going to a lot, you know, as many outcrops as we can, and going along and trying to collect uh, samples of fossils from as as many beds as we can. And you know, as we're going, we're doing the, uh, you know, we're measuring the thickness of each bed, looking, recording lithology, sedimentary structures, all the normal sedimentological kind of stuff, um, keeping a log of the stratigraphic section and you know, marking wherever we take samples of fossils. Here's one of my former students uh, hammering out a sample. And this is what the samples tend to look like. Oftentimes they're you know, slabs of sandstone, sandstone or siltstone with, with impressions of brachiopods. Then we bring them back to Connecticut. Uh, if they need some more preparation in the lab to expose the fossils, we do that. And then we try and identify as many, you know, individuals, brachiopods in the sample as we can and uh, count them up. And uh, a lot of these fossils were, you know, described by James Hall back in the 1800s. Uh, and eventually we ended up just taking photographs of, of all our different species and making our own little photographic guide to help us identify them. Um, and to make sure that everybody's identifying them all the same way. And I keep saying we, and I'm referring to you know myself and uh, a bunch of my recent graduate students, um, and they're the ones who've actually done a, a lot of the hard work on this. And those of you who know Jaylee can can hear all about her her brachiopod PTSD from this project. Um, so just to point everybody out. Uh, you know, Andrew Beard, Sarah Brisson, Jay Lee Peer, Jim Kerr, and currently uh, Brett Gallagher. Uh, so we have tons of lane cases full of, full of brachiopods. At the moment, our data set 
combined consists of about 28,000 counted brachiopod specimens in about 400 samples and almost 40 species of brachiopods. And just to give you a sense of how you know densely we're, we're trying to collect here, here's a, uh, a drawing of the, the stratigraphic section at one of our sites, Cameron, New York. Um, it's a pretty long section, uh, almost 100 meters. And uh, it's particularly nice because both pulses of the extinction are, are exposed here. Um, and each of these colored bars is, uh, uh, marks a, a species of brachiopod. They're uh, labeled at the top and bottom. And all the black lines show where each of these species has been sampled, um, just to give, it, give a sense of, of, of how hard we're trying to hit these outcrops. Um, so I'm going to jump right to the kind of to the end here um, to sort of uh, show uh, uh, the ranges of all the brachiopods combined from, from all the different outcrops. Um, so on this diagram, you know, time's going up and all of these are species of brachiopods that occur before the, the first pulse of the extinction, uh, which is shown by this red line. And then as we go through the first pulse of the extinction, about half of those species disappear. About half of them go extinct. So it's a pretty big extinction event. Um, and about half of them survive. And those survivors are joined by some new species, probably uh, immigrants from other areas. Some of these we know moved in from, from further out west. Some of them we're not sure. Um, and then of all these species that are present uh, going into the second pulse of the extinction, almost all of them survive. Uh, as far as we can determine, there were only two victims of this second pulse. Um, and this is really weird because, you know, if you read about other areas around the world, most people say that that second pulse is the big one. But what we're seeing here is that in, in New York, the, the first pulse is the big one. Um, so for uh, part of her project, uh, you know, Jaylee tried to test different factors that might uh, help us explain why, you know, this set of species here go extinct in the first pulse of the extinction while these species survive. So are there some traits shared by these species over here that explain why they went extinct? and some traits that explain why these over here survived. We were doing this looking at the first pulse of the extinction because so few things go in, extinct in the second pulse that it, it's hard to even talk about patterns. Um, so Jaylee looked at a number of different factors like, you know, size, you know, is big versus small species important? Um, she looked at, you know, is it important whether the species is rare versus common? Some theories say that rare species should be more sensitive to extinction. Uh, you know, was it things that lived in uh, deep versus shallow water that were, were most sensitive? And none of those factors uh, seemed to be related to, to survival. But the one thing that was obviously related to survival was which order of brachiopods did a species belong to? That's shown here with the, the colors. And in particular, you see that of all the species that were around before the first pulse of the extinction, these red ones, which are the atropids, uh, all go extinct. And the yellow ones, uh, the strophominids, those all go extinct too. And most of the orange ones do as well. Those are orthids. There's only one green one here and it goes out. That's a spurifurinid. Uh, but the, the gray ones, the spirifers, the teal ones, the rhynchonellids, the purple ones, the productids, most of them sail through. So there seemed to be a, a, a clear pattern there. Um, and what we think that's related to is, uh, uh, we expect suspect that it's related somehow to, to temperature tolerance. Because um, these four orders here that do poorly if you look at the, the geographic distribution of them in the Devonian, um, they are mostly only occur in the, the tropics to subtropics. Uh, these are groups that seem to only occur in, in warm habitats. And the other four orders 
uh, also extend into to higher latitudes, into temperate and, and polar uh, habitats. Um, so we, we, we tried to test this a couple different ways, both based on the, the uh, you know, uh, latitudinal distributions at the order level and also at the species level. And it, it came out the same that, that species that seemed to have more of a tropical affinity were, were the ones that preferentially got killed. And so that matches really well with the fact that uh, various people have documented that this was uh, uh, these these extinctions were coincident with pulses of global cooling, because um, you'd expect those to kill off the the warm water things, um, just like we're worried about polar bears today as as uh, we enter into a a warming pulse. And in fact, that that pattern. Um, uh, we haven't tested it rigorously, but it it uh, this pattern of certain orders doing poorly in this extinction also holds if you uh, look globally. Um, all of the atropids everywhere die out by the second pulse of extinction globally, and virtually all of the strophominids die out at this time too. Um, so that's our best our best guess as to you know what killed things off and, and why was that it was this this pulse of global cooling that's most consistent with the the, the extinction selectivity. Um, but it still leaves the question, why was this first pulse so big and the second pulse so small uh, when that's not what you would expect, you know, hearing about what happened in, in Europe or, or China or wherever. In fact, like if if we didn't know that there were supposed to be two pulses of extinction based on other parts of the world, like I'm, you know, you wouldn't even call this a mass extinction. It's just a couple of species. Um, it, you know, it's not really a pulse of extinction. It's kind of a big nothing burger, really. Uh, so in uh, 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 Jaylee's paper, she uh, suggested that uh, maybe what was happening here was that this large first pulse of the extinction in the Appalachian Basin relates to geography. And uh, specifically, the uh, Appalachian Seaway here appears to be somewhat isolated from other bodies of water at the time. Um, in part, that's based on the fact that most of the species in here right before the extinction are, are endemic. They only show up in the, the Appalachian Basin. Um, and it's cut off by, you know, some land barriers. And people have talked about this, the, the, these barriers to dispersal for, for a long time. Um, there are geographic barriers that might prevent uh, species from moving around. There's also a habitat difference. Uh, you know, the Appalachian Seaway was right next to this big uh, mountain range, and there was tons of mud and sand pouring in, and the species here had to, to be adapted to that. So our, our, our suggestion is that um, perhaps everything that was vulnerable to extinction in this seaway got killed right away because as the climate changed, they weren't able to really move around to, to track their, their favorite climate zone the way maybe you could in, in other areas uh, where you had more freedom to, to migrate. Um, so there's a couple, you know, lessons here that, 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 uh, kind of relate to how we we view extinction. You know, number one, you know, there's a suggestion in the these data that uh, uh, climate change could have been, you know, an important killer in this fauna, um, which you know adds to lots of evidence that that climate change appears to be a major factor in a lot of mass extinctions, um, and also uh, ties in well with the idea that. Um, one way for species to survive is, is to have migratory pathways uh, that they can take as the climate changes. And if they don't have those for, for one reason or another, um, they're more vulnerable. Let's see. Checking my time. Okay. So uh, kind of switching, starting to switch to the, uh, the effects of the extinction. Um, one of the effects both in, in New York and globally is that uh, the, the orders of brachiopods I'm, I'm showing here become kind of the dominant orders as the, the atropids and, and strophominids get wiped out. And that could be important ecologically because uh, it's been argued over the years that 
um, a lot of these kinds of brachiopods shown here are probably more resistant uh, to predators, uh, more resistant to being eaten, and also more resistant to other kinds of disturbance like you know waves and currents and things and storms. Uh, many of these have uh, uh, pedicles, stalks to attach down to the substrate. Um, some of these can even cement down and the, the spiny productids, uh, 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 many of them use their spines to kind of root into the, the substrate like uh, shown in this illustration. And that may have made it harder to eat them because um, it would have been harder to, to pull them up. You know, predators may not have wanted to put something spiky in, in their mouth as well. And this is, you know, during the time when when predatory fish, jawed fish were, were radiating. Um, so this change in the, the, the brachiopod fauna might have been pretty important. And it seems like it was driven in part by this extinction. So with that in mind, um, another of our projects focused uh, in on these uh, taxa that were around before the first pulse of extinction and survived that pulse of extinction. Because um, before the extinction, these species are, you know, living with, you know, this group of competitors. And then after they're living with a very different uh, uh, set of species mixed in among them in the, in, in the Devonian communities. Um, so that's a big change. They also had to survive all of the, you know, changes in, in climate and so on uh, that went along with the extinction. Um, so a lot of things have happened to them. And our question was, you know, how do they react? How do these survivors re react, you know, to the change in community structure that is apparent in, in, this, in this data and also to those uh, uh, environmental perturbations? And we did that by looking at the ecological niches that they inhabit in as much detail as we can. Um, and you can define an ecological niche as the combination of environmental conditions that a species requires to live, both biotic factors and abiotic factors. Um, and we're focusing on in on the habitats that, that, that these things live in, which reflect a lot of these environmental conditions. Uh, and specifically, do species change their niches during the mass extinction, the things that survive? Um, do they inhabit different environmental conditions after the extinction than they did before? Or do they just keep living in the same habitat as before and kind of just keep trucking and doing, doing the same thing they've always done? And in the uh, biological literature, this is uh, referred to as niche evolution versus niche conservatism. Niche evolution is when a species, you know, evolves to live in a, a, a different niche than it used to, and niche conservatism is when they they stay the same. Um, and uh, you know, uh, I think it's very interesting, you know, to look at past mass extinctions to see if they triggered niche evolution, um, particularly, you know, as we face the next couple hundred years. So here's a cartoon of what New York might have kind of looked like at the time you know, mountain range over New England, uh, coastal plain with rivers and such in eastern New York, then a shallow marine zone, and then deeper marine. Again, we're kind of focused in on this shallow marine zone. So what we're kind of testing is, you know, if you had a species that lived in this environmental zone up here, um, you know, before the extinction, did it, did it move to a different environmental zone after? Um, or did they go from deep to shallow, uh, et cetera? And uh, this is work done by Sarah Brisson. It was uh, published uh, a little less than a year ago, I think. Um, and she used a, a statistical technique called nonmetric multidimensional scaling, um, which I don't have time to explain. But in this plot, each of these uh, 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 data points is a sample. And uh, uh, the idea is that uh, you, uh, the different axes here hopefully represent some of the, the major environmental uh, gradients that control which species live where. And kind of skipping to the end, you know, a couple of lines of evidence indicate that, you know, the position of a sample on the x-axis here corresponds to uh, deeper habitats versus more shallow habitats. And the y-axis corresponds to living in uh, low disturbance environments or in environments that are more disturbed 
disturbed by things like storms and so on. And uh, we can, uh, from these data, we can sort of reconstruct, you know, where on this deep to shallow gradient did did each species live. Um, and here, here's that data kind of summarized for all of the species that were uh, reasonably abundant and that survived through the extinction. Um, but these data are entirely based on samples from before the extinction. So each of these bell curves is a species. Um, and, you know, the peak of the bell curve kind of shows uh, its preferred environment on this deep to shallow gradient. So this like red and the, the pink one over here, those, those are species that live in shallow water and these live in, in deeper water. And then the, the breadth of the bell curve kind of indicates the, the range of conditions under which it lives. And this, these, this graph here is a summary of, you know, tons and tons of data kind of distilled down. So that's before the extinction. And then this is after the extinction. Um, and it's the same species colored the same way. And you can see some differences, um, like here the pink uh, bell curve is kind of narrow and tall. Here it's uh, kind of wider. But if you just focus on kind of the peak of each curve, kind of the, the, the habitat in which each of these species is most abundant, and kind of trace them from one to the other, it lines up pretty well. Um, the species that preferred to live in shallow water before the extinction are still living in shallow water after the extinction. Um, those that lived in the middle are still living in the middle. This one that lives more in deep water is, is still in deep water. Um, and some of these curves get kind of wider through time. Some get kind of narrower, um, but overall they don't tend to go in, in one of those directions or the other. Um, and if you correlate, you know, the preferred depth of these species before and after the extinction, the, 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 the R squared is very high. Um, so in, in plain English, you know, the species that survived through the extinction exhibited niche conservatism. Um, they stayed, kept living in the same habitat they were living in before the extinction. Um, the extinction and all the changes it triggered didn't induce them to evolve at all and, and start to live somewhere else. Um, no evidence that the, the breadth of the niches got consistently wider or narrower. It's, it's tough statistically to say much more than that. And so in other words, the species that survived didn't seem to notice that anything had happened, if you can put it that way. They just kept doing the same thing they always did. So let's see if I have time yet. One final uh, little part of the project that we've gotten done so far relates to what I'm going to call hitchhikers. Uh, the, uh, all the little organisms that live uh, by encrusting onto the brachiopod shells, or in some cases, things that bore holes into the brachiopod shells. Um, and this, is, this isn't one of our samples. It was just a nice, nice picture off of, of Wikipedia. So... We kept seeing some of these these what I'm calling hitchhikers on our on our fossils as we worked on them and eventually decided to to, to look in more detail. Uh, this is work done by Jim Kerr. Um, he went through and cataloged all of all of these traces on our shells. Uh, so that's a trace of a sponge, a trace of some kind of worm probably. That's a bryozoan that was encrusting onto a, a brachiopod shell. That's a little thing called a microconchid that was encrusting onto a shell. And these were little things called uh, heterellids. Uh, so Jim went through all of our brachiopods, you know, tabulating all of these things. Uh, this is this shows some of his data from that same stratigraphic section at Cameron, New York. Um, so each of these vertical bars is, you know, one of those uh, types of organisms. And uh, you can see with the little lines marking uh, which, uh, uh, which samples they were found in. And uh, the main picture here is that, you know, you basically see the same set of characters down here before the first pulse of the extinction and after the first pulse of the extinction. They get a little rare in here, but then they come back. And then at this section, there's not enough, not enough data to see what's happening up above. Um, 
but by you know tabulating data from a whole bunch of different localities, what Jim found was that you know none of these hitchhiking taxa went extinct in the uh, in the late Devonian event in New York. Um, and it turns out they they weren't super picky about whose shell they lived on. Our thought was like if there were some you know of these hitchhiking taxa that particularly loved living on strophominids or something like that, what were what would they do if the strophominids went extinct? Um, you know, would that extinction kind of propagate, you know, through the system? Um, uh, but it turns out that they they don't really care too much what what shell they live on. They are more likely to be found on large shells. Um, that pattern's been seen elsewhere. They probably are just more likely to to, to land on them because they have greater surface area. There was a slight preference for ribbed shells and a slight pre and a preference for shallow water settings over deeper water settings. Um, but otherwise, they seem uh, uh, not to have been too bothered by by this extinction. So kind of summing up, uh, you know, what I've said about the uh, the effects of this extinction on the fauna, um, you know, brachiopod communities in New York and elsewhere shifted towards uh, what are thought to be more disturbance and predation resistant varieties like productids, the, the ones with all the, the spines. Uh, the species of brachiopods that survived, you know, through this extinction exhibited niche conservatism. That is, the, the extinction didn't trigger them to evolve uh, in a way where they, they inhabited a new, new environment afterwards. And uh, hitchhiking taxa don't seem to have been greatly affected by the extinction. And kind of linking back to to what I was talking about at the beginning about using, you know, the fossil record and, and what we see in mass extinctions to, to help us think about the future. Um, what we're seeing in the, uh, the late Devonian extinction is in New York is that, you know, a mass extinction can have very different effects on different parts of the earth, possibly due to differences in geography and things like that. Um, and specifically, the New York fauna was hit hard by the first extinction pulse uh, but not the second. And that's very different from what you see elsewhere. Climate change is often associated with mass extinctions. Um, the selectivity of the extinction here suggests that that global cooling might have been the most important killer in this fauna. And, you know, climate change is, is certainly a factor in a lot of extinctions that, that people have studied. And at least in this case, the extinction didn't seem to have noticeable indirect effects on surviving species. Um, and there I'm referring back to the, uh, the fact that you don't see any niche evolution in the survivors. You don't see the extinction, you know, affecting the hitchhiking taxa in any way. And um, on some level, that's kind of good news for thinking about extinction because, you know, one thing we people worry about is, you know, as you start to kill certain species off, what are the effects going to be on all the other species around them? Um, and we didn't see that in this case. Um, but my guess is that this may be sort of a best case scenario we're, we're looking at here. Um, uh, in large part, because, you know, these are brachiopods. They just kind of sit there on the seafloor filtering. They, they don't really interact with each other, uh, particularly other than maybe some some weak competition over food. Um, and maybe you'd see something very different if you were working on a group of organisms that that have a lot more interactions that exhibit, you know, territoriality uh, or, or if you were looking at predators or, or something like that, um, you might have a lot more kind of secondary indirect effects due to those stronger interaction networks. So that's my view of the late Devonian mass extinction in New York so far. Uh, we're continuing to to work on this, um, and you know we'll continue to do so. Hopefully, hopefully for for many years yet. You know, there's lots of lots of excellent rocks and fossils out in New York to you know that have haven't been collected yet. Uh, and with that, I I think I'm done.
Thanks, Andy. Very interesting. And uh, uh, we can open it up for questions. And I'll note a couple of people just came on, which makes me think there might have been some time zone confusing confusion. But I'll note that uh, we are live on YouTube, which makes a recording instantly available. So if you, you just came on and and missed the bulk of it, you can catch it on it. Uh, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat in a minute, but uh, let's open it up for questions and comments and so forth. And you can uh, use the hand raising fe feature on uh, Zoom, um, hit the reaction button and you can raise your hand or you can just uh, uh, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Um, I guess uh, I'll get started um, since there isn't don't isn't, doesn't seem to be anybody else at the moment with the question. So I wondered, um, Andy, if you could say a few words about how, if at all, ocean anoxia plays into the Appalachian Basin faunas. Sure. Um, so I. Uh, some of you may know Diana Boyer. Uh, you know she's done some some work looking at how much ocean anoxia there there was associated with these events, um, and she's found that in kind of the deeper water parts of the section, uh, there's probably some anoxia, but kind of maybe fluctuating seasonally. Um, uh, we've done a, collected a little bit of data on that that suggests that once you get into the areas we're working on. Um, uh, uh, the extinction layers are, are kind of low oxygen, but not, not anoxic. There's still some, some signs of life in there. Um, what I would love to be able to do though, is trace these extinction layers, you know, even farther to the East, um, because, you know, there may have been places farther to the East, uh, uh that were still oxygenated at the time. In fact, there must have been because because things survived, um, and to be able to track that out would be would be lovely. Um, the I would say that even even if the anoxia was not the direct killer, you know, in this fauna, it doesn't mean it wasn't important in killing off other things. Um, and uh, one of the reasons given for why you had these pulses of cooling is is related to the anoxia so for whatever reason low oxygen conditions spread over you know a considerable area at this time and once the the bottom waters get anoxia you can start burying a lot of organic matter a lot of you know dead plankton um and you know once you start burying it without uh, uh, uh decomposing it that can start to to pull CO2 out of the, the atmosphere because um, they photosynthesize, use up CO2, and then they get buried and that carbon gets gets locked down underground. Um, so even if, you know, the anoxia wasn't always the, the main killer, it might have been um, a step in the development of the, the global cooling uh, by lowering the greenhouse effect. So basically the opposite of what we're doing today, instead of releasing carbon from the ground to the atmosphere, you know, you were taking carbon from the atmosphere and putting it in the ground. Um, I don't know, I find it really hard to, to, to decide how, I find it really hard to think about because, um, you know, these, the levels of the, where the extinction happened were coincided with sea level going up. So any, you know, oxygenated facies, you know, shot eastward towards the mountains. And, and I've never been able to track them down much further than I have. So, and thank you. That, that was a very uh, comprehensive, interesting answer. So it sounds like you're, you're saying that as far as you can tell from the data that you have available, ocean anoxia did not play a major role in, in the extinction, at least of the brachiopod faunas that you're looking at, maybe other things or maybe things in other places. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and my my personal opinion is that probably globally the, the climate change was more important um, because the, 
the tropical orders of brachiopods like the atropids get killed off globally. And, you know, it's it's easy for me to see that as a, a response to climate change. And and that's been an idea that's been out there in the literature since since the 1970s, that the loss of some of these tropical things at this time could be related to, to climate change. Um, also, reefs, you know, a 10 degree drop in temperature would be a good way to kill off reefs. Right. But. But a lot of people still like the anoxia idea as as the main killer. And, you know, I don't want to tell other people what killed off their fossils if I haven't studied them. There you go. Yeah. Anoxia seems perhaps inherently more likely to be patchy in its distribution, but I don't know if that's necessarily the case. One question. Have you had a chance to look at other, other uh, animals, uh, corals and sponges and bryozoans that aren't hitchhikers and those sort of things. And have you seen seen this similar where the first pulse, at least in New York, seemed to wipe most of the things out and then the second pulse was kind of maybe a little bit more? Yeah, so we've collected quite a few corals from before the first pulse. And, you know, I, 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 I don't put them front and center because we've never done the hard work of identifying exactly what what species we have. But before the first pulse of the extinction, we see uh, pretty commonly, you know, some pretty large rugose corals um, at a lot of places. And those seem to get entirely wiped out by that first pulse as well. Um, and uh, other people have reported kind of small ones living in deeper water after that. But at least the big shallow ones seem to get killed off uh, uh, in the, at the same time as most of the brachiopods. Um, the bryozoans are tough. Like a lot of times they're just, you know, impressions and, um, you know, bryozoan people like to make thin sections of their bryozoans to identify them. And we just don't have good enough preservation for that. Um, uh, uh, Judith Nagel Myers and her student Tom Van Tassel are, are starting to look at the, the clams and what they do across, across this extinction. Um, I think there's probably enough enough clam fossils that we could we could say something. I'm trying to think what else. You know, crinoids, it's usually just, you know, columnals. Um, we don't have enough good good fossils to to really know. I have a follow-up question. Um curious, why are um the Eurypterid fossils so common in the Herkimer area, and um, and where else might they might you find them in Western New York? Thank you. So, um, is the Herkimer stuff like the the Silurian? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not sure exactly what depth. I'd have to read up on that exactly why they're preserved so well in that particular setting i think it's if i recall it's it's what might be some sort of like hyper saline setting mm. and i don't know if that kind of prevented them from decaying or, or something like that um what i do know is that by the time you get to the late devonian i think they're they're not as diverse and i think they're more living in like more freshwater environments some of them mm -hmm. um uh roy plotnik had a paper come out sometime recently on the uh, the Devonian, I think it was Devonian and Carboniferous Eurypterids in this area. Um, so that they are there. They're they're not as preserved as well as 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 the ones in 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 the Herkimer area. Um, but they they every once in a while you do find one. Not me. I've never found one. But mm. Somebody. And then yeah, and then looking at your geologic uh, map, such as um, I also noticed, I didn't realize it, um, that that area near Herkimer and those surrounding areas were maybe in the shallower parts of the Inland Sea. And I'm wondering if those um, <clears throat> Eurypterids lived in more shallow, kind of warmer waters. Could be. I'd have to look, I'd have to look more into the Silurian uh to say anything more specific. 
Um, certainly, at my my recollection is that those those really good ones I, I think are maybe coming out of a, a hypersaline, like really mm. shallow, really really shallow, like hypersaline yes. type type environment. Um, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Alan's got a hand up. Um, yeah, so I was going to ask uh, uh, one of the th reasons that the right, anyway, says that we don't need to worry about um, climate change is because it's normal. It happens off and on like that. And when you've been talking about this with climate change, I tend to not believe that, but that kind of seems to make like that may be the case. So might this just be another little thing? Granted, we don't want to be extinct, but nevertheless, is it just part of the pattern that's been going on for millions of years, I guess? Um, I mean, there's definitely, you know, parallels that you can draw between what's happening today and, and things that have happened in the in the past. Um, you know, I, I I've, I've been focusing on these events that were, were cooling events um, and then. Uh, but there's a bunch of others that are, are warming events where CO2 was released and the planet got hotter. Um, so on some level, yeah, like climate changes, you know, it, it's not static. It's changed a lot over, over Earth's history. Um, but what we also see in the fossil record is when it changes a lot very fast, you know, there's a lot of bad consequences in terms of things dying, uh, things dying off. Um, so, you know, even if it, even if it can change naturally, it doesn't mean it's not going to be really painful when it happens. Yeah, and I'll, I'll follow up on that in a couple of ways. I was, I was going to ask if you'd seen the, uh, recent, Thank you. um, recent ocean temperature, uh, graph for 24 and, and which I actually pulled up to ask the question and I have, the ability to share screen, so I will. Um, and I'll also, uh, so there is, uh, um, the yellow is 2023 and the red is 2024 for global sea surface temperature. And uh, that's pretty frightening. <laughs> um, uh, and I'll also note that uh, um, in response to the folks who say the climate has been changing forever, that's, Partly true, but if, but it's very much worth noting that it's changing now because of us burning stuff. And until the Silurian period, there essentially wasn't any fire because there was no fuel, um, which is, you know, products of photosynthesis that was dry on land and there wasn't enough oxygen in the atmosphere. So I think that's a really important point to raise with those folks. But I wanted you to <laughs> comment on, on this graph and, you know, extrapolating from your research to what we're seeing going on now. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope we're not at the, the tipping point, but it certainly looks like we we could be. Um, like, I have to say this this winter in Connecticut has, you know, been a lot warmer than I'm used to. Um, the past couple of winters have been pretty nice, too, and not a lot of snow. I mean, it definitely feels like the past few years, the climate has been different than what it was 10, 15 years ago. And that you can you can totally see that Oops. <laughs> in the data. Um, and I one of my kind of pet peeves is when. You know, people talk about like the world being warmer as if that's inherently like awful and, you know, things aren't going to be inhabitable anymore or, or anything. Cause you look at back at the past and, you know, there were plenty of times when the earth is warmer than today and, you know, there was tons of life everywhere. And at, for the time it was normal. Um, it's not like warmer. It's, you know, things aren't going to get so warm that the planet's uninhabitable. It's not like, you know, a little bit warmer is inherently bad. The, the trouble is, is that, you know, the, the transition to that is is going to involve a lot of loss, both in the natural world and the human world. You know, our, our infrastructure is just not in the right place for a world that's, you know, two degrees C warmer or whatever. Um, you know, the cities are in some of the cities are in bad places uh, for that climate. Um, so there's, you know, the transition is going to involve a lot of suffering, you know. It's not the it's not the it's not the exact temperature that matters. It's the switching between them. 
And Cadence got a hand, uh, hand up, Cadence. Um, so I had a question about, you mentioned a little bit about plants possibly oh. expanding. Um, I'm looking into my undergraduate thesis on more of the Hangenberg, so after this event. Mm -hmm. I, that's been like a reoccurring like model that I see in like almost every paper is about plant expansion. So I wonder if you knew anything additional upon that, how that may have impacted just the environment back then. Yeah. So the, uh, you know, the general idea is that, you know, plants were, were, uh, you know, expanding over the landscape quite a bit at this point in time, you were starting to get tree sized plants. Um, and that that uh, helped trigger some some changes in kind of global biogeochemical cycles. Um, specifically, you know, the the plants are sucking down CO two and also uh, changing kind of weathering rates in the in the soil. Um, and sp specifically in the context of the Hangenberg, you know, you at the, which is the extinction at the end of the Devonian. There's good evidence for for glaciers forming. Um, so not just cooling pulses, but cooling pulses to the point where you get, uh, glaciers when, you know, the, the late Devonian otherwise is, is a pretty warm time period. Um, so part of the idea I think is, is that, you know, the, the rise of land plants just kind of led to some long-term changes in the climate, um, eventually leading into, you know, a major ice age in, in the Carboniferous, um, but that by the the end of the Devonian, you were starting to 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 feel that. Um, I'm not an expert enough in the you know the details of biogeochemical cycles and, and models to 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 comment too in depth on you know how how realistic I think that is. But I you know I think it's it's definitely a, a consideration here um, that there were probably some some major long term changes in, in the climate going on. Some models show CO two in the atmosphere declining quite considerably as as you go from the Devonian into the Carboniferous. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, other questions? I'm going to put a few links in the chat, but we can take another question or two. We're closing up for the night. So the links are, are to donate to support science in the virtual pub and to see what's coming up and to check out um, our YouTube channel. And again, if you want to see uh, or share the recording of tonight, that's under the live tab. Other questions or comments? Okay. Oh, maybe Jaylee? <laughs> Hi, Andy. Uh, Hi. <laughs> um, one, I just wanted to uh, personally thank you again for coming to give a talk. Um, it was really great um, to kind of see the extension of uh, all the work we had been doing a few years ago. Um, one uh, a question I have, and I'm not sure if you can answer it because it's not something I was thinking about working on deep time stuff. But now that I've transitioned and switched from brachiopods to bivalves and I'm working on decades to centuries instead of millions of years. Um, uh, my current project, we think a lot about like the time averaging of things being preserved in the layers. Like has there been any developments to be able to look at stuff for like the fossils like in the Devonian where, it, you know, it's rock. Um, I don't know if there's any like isotope signatures or something. Um, I think we, uh, so time averaging is, you know, the kind of the mixing of shells of different ages into the, the same layer and, you know, studies of, of kind of modern shells and modern environments suggest that in, in, you know, marine systems, you know, you often can have hundreds of years worth of shells kind of mixed into the, the same layer, uh, uh. Supposedly, if you go out on the beach and, and pick up a shell, it, it could be hundreds or, or thousands of years old um, if it got like kind of buried and, and dug back up. Um, my general assumption, and I think most people's general assumption, is that a lot of these, you know, shelly brachiopod deposits are time averaged. Um, in terms of, you know, how you could test that or tell how time averaged they are, um, you know, I I think that's pretty 
challenging. Like one idea I heard someone float once was like if you kind of found the growth bands through a shell and, you know, did carbon isotopes to kind of look at temperature fluctuations to to do a bunch of shells and, and see if, you know, the temperature fluctuations were, were similar from one to the next um, from year to year. But that would be a, a heck of a lot of work to to, to do that. Um, so, yeah, probably a lot of these are time averaged. You know, how much is just sort of a, a guesstimate based on, you know, studies, you know, in the modern world. Um, certainly sometimes you can, you know, just based on the, the the sedimentology and the stratigraphy, you can have a sense that that some some things may be more time averaged than others. Um, but, you know, in terms of an actual number, I think we're guessing at orders of magnitude here. And I don't think it's going to change any of the results that we found. I was just curious. Any other one, maybe one last question, or maybe we're done. Thanks so much, Andy. It was a sure. great Thanks for having me again. Thank you. And uh, happy Darwin Days next week, or happy Darwin Day next week to celebrate his birthday. But, uh, yeah, um, thank you so much. That was great. Really thanks. Learned a lot. Thanks everybody for coming. All right. And yeah. I hope to get out there again soon. That would be great. You're welcome anytime, as you know. <laughs> thanks. Yeah. Thanks all.